Okay, so, um, yeah, I was quite interested um, to find out about this thing which I'm going to talk about because, uh, so I'll explain, I guess, what the quintic is and what it means to be unsolvable in a bit, but I've always heard this, and I've heard it as like, you know, it's a, quite a difficult proof, and, you know, it takes um, a semester of study, like, to learn this thing called Galois theory, and it's, uh, yeah, you just got, like, a lot learn a lot of like uh, hard concepts and go through difficult things to finally get to this. And it turns out that like this is um, not the case. There's like a mathematician slash physicist named B.I. Arnold, I think it's from Russia, who came up with a, uh, a proof that he wanted to explain it to high schoolers. And I'm not sure if he succeeded in that, but he came up with the <laughs> he, what he thought was high schoolers going to understand. Um, and I don't know why, like, I don't know, I feel like I know some mathy people, but I never heard of this before. And I'm not sure if it's because of some like east-west divide, like information in the flow or something like that. But I came across it, you know, a few months ago. I was pretty interested. So I thought I would present it. And I, I originally, as you can see, I originally called it why is the quintic unsolvable, and then I realized I don't know why, and so I, I can't really explain that. But I can uh, tell you how we know it. And what I mean, I tried to explain what I mean by the, this sort of dialogue here. You can imagine there's some sort of uh, computational fact, and you have some annoying child who's like, well, why is that true? And then like you say, well, I can tell you how to do that multiplication and we can do it together and you can see why that number comes out. And they say, well, no, 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 but, but, but why? And then the, you say, well, I don't know. It's just like, that's what the computation is. And in this case, there probably is some deep reason why the fifth degree polynomial is the first one uh, to be unsolvable. But I don't know what it is, but I, I will explain how it can be kind of reduced to a computation, which you could do on paper and like, you know, just the same way you could do some sort of multiplication on paper and say, well, I see, you know, it really can't be solved. And I think that in and of itself is a, um, it's pretty significant. Um, okay. Uh, so let's now, by the way, I actually don't know how this is going to interact with, is this this way? Oh, okay. kind of a delay. Okay. Um, also, uh, Tom was asking uh, how long this talk is going to be. I don't know, but I forgot to bring my iPad charger, so there's a hard limit based on the battery in my iPad. <laughs> so it's not going to be forever. <laughs> okay, it's going to last forever. Tom has got a Tom's got a charger. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the basic creature, I guess, that we're discussing is polynomials or polynomial equations, and these are things like this, like you know, you have some variable which you usually call x, and uh, you know, you can multiply things, you can multiply it by constants, you can add things. So in particular, you can get any sort of finite power, x to the 1,000. Uh, we can allow complex coefficients, i plus 1, or just sort of any number, 3 pi, whatever. And you set it equal to 0, and you want to find the numbers which um, satisfy that equation. And for uh, the um, polynomial equations like that are uh, where the largest term is x squared, or x cubed, or x to the fourth, there is a solution in what's called like an algebraic expression, which is like a polynomial, except for you're also allowed to use square roots, cube roots, fourth roots, etc. And you're allowed to like nest them arbitrarily. Um, is this going to work? Oh yeah. Wait. It's going to work. Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't know. So I just like so this is the uh, this is the well it should be the quadratic formula that people sort of learned in school, and then there's a couple other random expressions and radicals that. I just wrote down for fun. Okay, so the question of solving a quintic uh, is the same as the question of solving a quadratic. With a quadratic polynomial, you can express all the solutions as an algebraic uh, expression, in particular this one. And I won't write it down here, although it's in some future slide. You can do it for the cubic as well. You can also do it for the quartic. And it was proved a few hundred years ago that you can't do it for the quintic. And that's what this talk is about. Um, but it's actually a little bit finicky what these radicals are. So um, let me tell you what it means in a little bit more detail, or at least clarify a couple of points about what the, what the radical actually means. So we do want to work over the complex uh, numbers for this talk. And I won't really go into all the reasons for that. It's just like kind of better. Like polynomials sort of work better if you work over the complex numbers. Like things are like nicer. Um, and so we're going to have the radical, this is the nth root of a, refer to all n uh, complex nth roots of a uh, 
unless a is zero, in which case there's just one. But if there's if a is any non-zero complex number, the uh, there's always n nth roots of a. Okay, so this is like a multi-valued expression, which is a little bit weird. Um, in particular, it's not really clear like how you're supposed to combine it, like when you have more than one of these things in an expression. And so we're just going to take like the most expansive uh, possible convention where you just allowed to make any possible choice that you want. So for example, here, an expression like cube root of 2 plus the square root of 3, we're going to say, okay, well, you had three choices here, and you had two choices here. So we're just going to take all of them. We're just going to look at everything that this might refer to, and that's six values. And because of that expansiveness, it's not really going to be possible, in general, to come up with an algebraic expression which captures just the solutions to some polynomial equation and nothing else. So we'll also be generous and say that an algebraic expression solves a polynomial equation if it contains every solution, but it might contain some other stuff too. Otherwise, it's not really not possible to do this. Um, and I put in here a screenshot. So this is the cubic equation. I put in here a screenshot. Uh, if you don't know this guy, this is a YouTuber named The Mythologer who makes pretty good videos. And um, he did a video recently on the cubic equation, which is also really good. Uh, and so this is just the way I just, I mean, I took a screenshot so I didn't have to copy it myself. This is the cubic equation, and um, so if you have a polynomial in this form, you've already eliminated the x squared term because there's like some standard trick to do that. This is like the typical cubic equation. And so you can see here that there's something weird going on because, so these square roots give you two choices each, and these cube roots give you three choices each. So like naively, this would actually give you like 36 possible values. Um, in fact, it doesn't. Like many of them turn out to be equal, but it does actually give you nine possible values, and only three of them can be solutions to the cubic equation. And that's true. Only three of them are. Six of them are solutions to some other cubic equation. But we're going to say that's okay. That, that's fine. We're going to, you know, you, once you have this, and you get all the nine answers, we're going to say well, you can go through and try them, and you can throw out the ones which are not right, and we'll just accept that as a correct, um, a correct solution to this equation. By the way, if you don't do this, you can still solve it, but you have to use something else. This is like, there's another way to think about the cubic equation where you have, where you use this, where all these things have real values, and you use um, trig uh, and um, use trig functions for the other case, which I didn't know about before. But I don't know this is. Yeah. So you can see that in the actual, in the real cubic formula. In fact, you do have a square root inside a cube root. And so what I'd like to prove now is that this is nesting is necessary. OK, so this is now the real test for technology. So um, one of the most important facts about these complex radicals is that they can't be ordered consistently, meaning that like there's no real way to say um, you know, given a, um, a complex number, what's its first square root and what's its second square root? The same way that you can do it in the real numbers. Like, in the real numbers, you can always say, well, a positive number has a positive square root and a negative square root. And there's no way to do that in the complex numbers. And I would like to show you why. And I will. So th this app that I'm using has, like, allows you to use embedded web browsers. Uh, this sounds like the sort of thing which is never going to work, but we'll give it a try. So this is a, a Desmos app that I, I made. De uh, so Desmos is also a pretty cool like online calculator you can sort of make um, demonstrations like this. So let me put it to two. So this is now showing the the purple dots are the square root of the green dot, and you can like move the green dot around. So you know the square root of well I'll just put five. The square root of five is two plus a little and minus two plus a little. The square root of 5i is uh, these things at a 45 degree angle. Is this actually visible? Hopefully it is. Is, is it visible? OK. Um, so, yeah, so you can move around however you like. Um, but the problem with like trying to order these roots, you're saying, like, oh, OK, well, you know, I've got five. I'm going to call this purple one, this positive one, the first one, and the negative one, the second one is that it's not consistent if you want this um, characterization to be continuous, meaning that like 
making a small change to the input results in a small change in the output. Because if you move the green dot around zero, so like it's going to come back all the way to where it started, but the purple dots have switched places. So if you had thought, like you know, if you had thought the positive one was the first one, and you keep track of it as you move the green one around, well now the negative one is the first one. Uh, and this is like kind of the fact which is going to be the engine for this whole this whole talk basically. And it's the case not just with square roots but with any root. So if I put the cube roots, so a similar thing happens. So if I if I move it around here, that's fine. But if I move it around once around the circle, they all do this sort of dance. They move one step over. And of course, if I go around again, the same thing happens. Um, was the question? No, I mean, what exactly is switching places? Because it's so, I mean, the dot isn't the solution, the dot is the representation. Yeah, that's right. So, so um, dots get, I mean, the fact that it's a different, like, if you look there, mm -hmm. like the fact that the, the dot that's on the y axis is a different dot than the y dot that was on the y axis before, does that really mean anything? Well, I, I don't know. I guess that's up to you and your personal <laughs> philosophy. I don't, can't answer that for you. I, uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely right. Like, because you can just imagine this. Like, this is just like a static fact. Like, the cube roots of five are these things here. And, like, the cube roots of, you know, four plus one i are these things here. And you've got a bunch of static facts. But it's a weird thing that if you take these static <laughs> facts and arrange them into, like, you know, a flip book, then something weird <laughs> happens where, like, you know, when you go around the circle, of course, like all the purple dots that were there have to be there because it's the same thing. It's the cube roots of five. But if you take all these little frames, you know, 60 frames per second or whatever, and just like put your finger on one of the purple dot <laughs> as it goes around, you'll say, oh, wait, that's now a different purple dot. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So you can. Yeah, it's mathematically meaningful, that's right, yeah. What's that? Uh, yes, that's right, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's why, so, um, so you can't define, so, right, so what you can say is you can't define any continuous single-valued function, which is, uh, you know, f such that, like, f cubed of x is always x for any complex number x. So if you spin it around zero three times, the original dot be back in its original place? Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> Does that work out by the polynomial? Does it what? Two for two, three for three, four for four. Yep, that's right. Yeah, it's 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 uh, uh, it's exactly uniform for every uh, every number. So it always so if you watch carefully, I haven't done this, but I assume it's gonna be true. So if you uh, go all the way once, they all spin around once, and however many roots there are, this is n equals six. They're going to move around one slot and come back to where they started. And it has to be around zero. So like, so it basically is counting how many times you go around zero. If you like do some wavy thing not around here, they're going to kind of, you know, undulate a bit, but they're going to come back to where they started. If you go around zero, if you go around zero, then they'll they'll switch over one. If you go around the other way, they'll switch back. <laughs> this is just the deep nature of complex numbers, I guess. Any other questions about that? Okay. This is a this is just a backup in case that one didn't work. And for this, uh, so yeah, so this is just kind of a cartoon about what happens. We just talked about. So you move this. So you have got z squared equals a, or just the square root of a. You move it around once. This goes there. This goes there. And the same thing for all higher dimensions. So for z cubed, you move it around once, and they do this dance. This goes there, this goes there, and this goes there. Probably should have. OK. Um, so that was a useful fact. And also this uh, operation that we just did of taking some sort of path in a parameter and seeing how the values of some multi-valued expression uh, get permuted when you move this parameter around a loop. This is actually going to also be a sort of crucial trick or operation that we do um, to get the results in here. And so I just thought I would highlight that. That So you can take any multi-valued expression. So 
here we're taking like something like the you know the square root of the cube root of a, but we're also going to um, soon take it to be like the solutions to some polynomial involving a, which is also multi-valued. And then we can take some loop alpha for a to go around, and then we can move a around that loop, and then see what happens to uh, the values of this expression. So they have to come back to where they started, but they don't have to. Each individual one does not have to come back to the individual slot it's left from. It can go someplace else. Uh, okay, so let's build up to the quintic by looking at the cubic first. And um, so you may recall that uh, you know the quadratic equation um, people often learn in school is you know whatever negative b plus or minus the square root of something over two a. Um, and so you might say, well, I, maybe for the cubic, you can just do the same thing. Maybe you can have some sort of polynomial here, plus, well, this, and this, there's no need for plus or minus, because we're taking all the values of the cube root here, you know, plus the cube root of something. You know, that's just kind of the straightforward, you know, generalization of the form of the quadratic formula to the cubic case. So maybe that's just going to work. Uh, and we'll show that it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and by the way, uh, this isn't the general cubic, just to keep things simple. It actually turns out that it's sufficient in all cases just to consider polynomials of this form. Well, there's just one parameter here, a. Um, so I made that simplification throughout. But OK, so let's see why uh, there can be no cubic formula that looks like this. The idea is just to use this similar trick that we uh, just looked at. We're going to examine loops that a could go through. And we're going to say, well, what do they do to the solution to, to values of this form? And we're going to try and find a loop that acts differently on values of this form than it does on solutions to this polynomial equation. OK, now here this is, so I, I don't know if you guys read the description. So there's this like um, website where this guy wrote a JavaScript application that like allows you to move the coefficients of a polynomial around, and it'll plot how the roots change. And so now we're going to look at um, solutions to this cubic using that tool. So OK, so the coefficients are up here. Oh, wait. Did I change this to 3? OK, so the first coefficient is always 1. I think so we want 2 to be 0. We want uh, 1 to be minus okay, 1. We want 1 to be minus 1. OK, so now a0 is the thing which I'm going to move around. So let me start at 0 and show you what happens. So the roots are on the bottom there. So when uh, a is 0, you can just kind of like double check that that's right. So that's, this is x cubed minus x equals 0. So this has roots minus 1, 0, and 1, because it's the same as x times x squared minus 1. And so now let's see what you can do um, if you move this around. So if I make a little circle on the right, so they all start dancing. And the one on the left, minus 1, came back to where it started. But the two rightmost ones switch places. Oh, do, uh huh. You see, so the two rightmost right -most ones switch places, the one on the left stay where it is. Similarly, if I move and make a circle on the left, the rightmost one comes back to where it is, one, but the two leftmost ones switch places. I'll do that again, too. <coughs> um, so that's what happens. Why does it happen? Well, I don't know. I, there's a, a thing in JavaScript that tells you it happens, so, so it happens. Um, at this one, I actually like do know more about like why this happens, uh, but I, I think it's better if I don't go into it now. But I can talk about it later. Uh, so yeah, so what happens is uh, better we do this. So these were, uh, 
These are the two. What's actually, sorry, what was your question again? You said that it's not possible to make two top dashes and have the other one dash doesn't stay in the translation. Mm -hmm. But isn't that what you just said now? In that solution form. Oh, in that form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, so you definitely can do it here. And the fact that you can't do it in the radical form is what means that that radical form can't be, can't be giving the solutions. These two things, where again, I just wrote out this schematic thing, this cartoon. What happens with these three roots, so if I move A around a circle here, these two guys swap places, this stays the same. If I move A around a circle here, these two guys swap places, and this guy stays the same. But now, like, what are the possible values of the expression here? Well, we actually kind of already know, because this, like, adding some extra thing here, like, this is the equivalent of, like, maybe minus b over 2 in the quadratic equation. Adding something here doesn't really change. Like, this is just going to shift everything by some variable amount, but it's not gonna really going to change the permutation behavior. So it's really just taking a path here and doing a cube root. Like, this cube root is the only place where something weird can happen with respect to permutations, and we already know everything that can happen. We know that either they can all stay the same, they can come back to where they are, they can all move over one if you go around um, zero once, or they can move over two if you go, over, go around twice. After that, it starts repeating. And in particular, it's always the case that either they all come back to where they started, or they all move. And it's never the case that two of them swap places, and one stays where it is. Um, and that's the proof. That's why it's not possible to have a cubic of this form. And this actually means that it's not possible to have a cubic equation of any form that doesn't involve, um, well, actually, let me, let me leave that for later. Because I want to um, prove something else first. But are there any questions about that before? Sorry, in the previous example, did you talk about where the two on the left swap places and the one on the right stays in the same one? The, uh, okay. So now let's um, go a step further and try to pin down what the form of the cubic formula must be. It's not just that you can't just have a radical. In fact, what's true is that, so I wrote here just you can't have the, even the sum of two radicals. Um, this was just kind of an example. What, what I really want to say here is that you can't, no cubic formula that doesn't have nested radicals, namely radicals inside radicals, can possibly work. And you can see that, I guess we can actually go back. Okay. So for this one, um, we're going to use a new idea. And the reason is that we can try and think about the previous sort of thing. But when we have like two radicals that um, are added together, it actually kind of becomes like a quite less, a lot more unclear what's happening. Because you've got to take all the sums of all like the possible values of the radical. And you have to like think about what they're doing as the path is moving. Um, because we said that our convention was you just have to have this equation include the roots. And so it could be like some weird sum where like, you know, I don't know, the path like cancels out. Like they both move, but it cancels out. So like that one doesn't move, but these two do. And that's just complicated. So the idea here is to find a path that will um, actually cause all the values for radicals to be fixed, but for where the, um, the values of the cubic equation will not be fixed. And in that way, we can deal with this case because if all the values of the radicals are fixed, then adding two of them together is it's still going to fix all the values of those that sum of radicals, and um, and we'll have our proof. And this type of loop is called a uh, commutator, or at least this particular type of loop which we're going to define, which is going to fix all the values for the radicals. And I believe the next slide will tell you what it is. Hopefully, it is. Okay. So the idea here is that we start with two loops, alpha and beta. And then the commutator, which is written like this, is the loop where you start by going around alpha once, then you go around beta once, then you go backwards around alpha, and then you go backwards around beta. The reason why we define it like this is because um, you can see without too much difficulty, I'll do this in the next slide, that every loop like this is always going to fix the values of a radical. 
So in that case, it's good, but it's also kind of complicated enough that we can get non-trivial behavior in general, like and hopefully non-trivial behavior of the roots. And first, let me say a little bit more. Yeah, okay. So let me say a little bit more about why a loop like this fixes all values of a radical. So we know that loops act on radicals by rotation. So if we were to, you know, say this is alpha, so we're going around alpha once, um, and these are the roots, I guess I picked the fourth root here. So this must like rotate the roots around something. So I guess it does, in this case I said, well maybe it does two, it goes around by two. And then when we go around by beta, it does some other rotation. Let's say it goes around by one. Then we go backwards around alpha, and so it must do the reverse thing, so it must go back by two. And then we go backwards around beta, and it must do the rest of that, and so it must go back by one. And so because the, um, the action of any path on a radical is just to move around by some fixed number of the roots, then when you have this thing where you do alpha, beta, alpha inverse, beta inverse, it must end up where it starts because it went forward by some n and forward by some m, then backwards by some n and then backwards by some m. So it has to fix values of every radical. Are these things associative? I mean, I would think that going alpha, beta, minus beta, and minus alpha would be more realistic than alpha, beta, minus alpha, minus beta. Did you say alpha, beta, minus beta, minus alpha? Yeah. Uh, I think that one, um, I, I think that will, so that will work in the sense that it will fix the values of the radical, but I think it will not give you non-trivial behavior of the, um, like in any case. Like I think it's always going to give you the identity, like even when you're not dealing with radicals, but dealing with the solutions to complex uh, polynomials. Um, so what do you mean by get something? If you compose beta and minus beta, you get, you get on you know, identity or some sort. Yeah, maybe. It's like, it's not quite clear because these are paths and I haven't defined, like you get, you still get some paths. Maybe in some way it's reducible to like a trivial path, but it's not like, um, I think it's not really clear from what I've said so far. It's definitely true like if you're working with um, like group elements or something like that, that like if you do a commentator, you couldn't define it as like alpha, beta, beta inverse, alpha inverse, because it would just always be the identity. Um, it's not clear what sense that would be the identity here because these are just paths and it would be some path and I don't know, maybe it has some properties. Um, but I think it's not gonna give us the properties that it won't, probably for the same reason that it wouldn't give us any interesting properties if it was a group element where you could just always reduce beta, beta inverse to the identity. Other questions? Okay. So it turns out that it's actually pretty easy to find commutators that are non-trivial. So these two loops, which I highlighted before, um, I'm really playing, playing a dangerous game, having my notifications come up here. Um, if, you, if I take these two loops that I had before, which, so we sort of mentioned, swap these two things and swap t these two things, which are kind of the only things we know, so let's take the commutator of those, like, what else do we have? So this is already non-trivial. And we can work this out, you know, just with a purely, like, finite computation. Like, so we know that alpha um, swaps the blue root and the green root. Beta swaps the blue root and the red root. So, and so alpha inverse does the same thing, because if you invert a swap, it's the same. And beta inverse does the same thing, so what does this do? Well, it sends the red root, the green root, like this. It sends the blue root to the red root, and there's only one other place for the green root, but it sends the green root to the blue root. And that's not the identity. And that's what the action of this path, the commutator of alpha and beta is on the roots of the equation, and it's not the roots of any radical uh, expression, which doesn't include nested radicals. Uh, so this is why you must have nistic radicals in order to have a valid cubic, uh, cubic formula. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's go one step up. Um, and so here, 
we're going to take a look at the quarter formula, which I don't have it written down anywhere, and I don't know what it is. I can't write it down. Uh, I guess we can look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, here we're going to show that, in fact, even that is not enough for the quartic formula. So here again, I wrote out uh, I wrote out some particular case, but what I really meant to say was there's no valid quartic formula which doesn't include radicals nested inside radicals nested inside radicals. So here I said, okay, well, this particular case, you can't have, this is like some plausible thing you might say, well, maybe this is a quartic formula. Um, but you can't have, this is not going to work ever either. Okay, and so let's see why that's the case. This is going to be a new trick added here as well. Oh, yeah, so let's, let's again take a look at what the possible solutions, uh, sorry, possible permutations of the quartic are. Okay, so this is four. Okay, so three is zero, two is zero, one is minus one, and zero moving. Okay, so starting with a equals zero, so you can see it's a similar thing here. We have one root at zero, and then the other n minus one n minus one roots here. It's three are arranged symmetrically around zero. And in fact, the exact same or exactly analogous thing happens. So if I move it in a small circle here, so two of the roots swap. The middle root swaps with the one on the right. The others do a little wiggle, but they come back to where they started. If I go in a circle around here, the one in the middle swaps with the one on the upper left. The others wiggle around and come back to where they started. And the same thing happens here if I do a circle around here. So again, the analogous things happens. And in fact, this happens in all dimensions. Well, not dimensions. It happens in all degrees. So again, we get the same thing. We have one blue root in the middle, roots range symmetrically around. And if I move this A around here, I can get this blue root to swap with any of the three ones, any of the three other roots. OK, and now. Uh, now comes a trick which uh, I think is like, a, it's, so, it's weird because it's like in some sense, uh, if you meditate on it, it becomes obvious, but it's also very complicated and hard to understand. Um, so what we did last, last time, by what you mean for the cubic um, formula, is we observed that if we have a commutator path, then that's going to keep fixed the values of these radical expressions. So if we move A around in a radical, uh, in a commutator path, all the values here are going to come back to where they started. But those paths, they move around and they come back to where they started, but they aren't themselves commutator paths. So if you put this inside a larger radical, then that might not be fixed because these paths came back to themselves, but they weren't themselves commutator paths. But if we find a path which is a commutator path of commutator paths, then when we move it around that path, the values of this radical are going to come back to where they started. And uh, like I said, if you meditate on this, it's obvious, but uh, it's not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote I, I uh, wrote a diagram which either will confuse you more or, uh, I don't know, hopefully it doesn't confuse you more. But so so here's kind of like three possibilities for what, what we could do. Uh, and so here we have. In this column, I have a. So this is the coefficient uh, that we're sort of moving around. Here's with one radical, no nesting. And here is with two radicals nested. So if you start, you just move like a around in a loop. No, nothing special, it's just a loop. Well, you know, this is just going to move from someplace else. Nothing special. Uh, we know it's going to, like, with an individual radical, it's going to move to the next, um, you know, the next root, depending on how many times it goes around zero. Uh, but otherwise, nothing special, and this is also nothing special. Okay. If you instead move a around in a commutator path, so like this, whoop, 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 we uh, sort of argued last time that okay, over here, this is going to move around in some loop, and just like you know, a loop here yields nothing special here, a loop here yields nothing special here. But if we move this in a commutator of commutators, so we go around one commutator, whoop, whoop. Whoop, whoop, and then around another commutator, whoop, 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 and then backwards around the first one. Whoop, whoop. Uh, that might not be correct. 
<laughs> and then backwards around the second one. This is definitely not correct. But, uh, okay, well, it's, it's so close, you can't see if I'm doing it right or not. Anyway, so. <laughs> so that's going to lead to a, a commutator path here. And so the reason is because, so when you do your first commutator here, well, that goes into some loop. Like we know that a commutator leads, yields a loop when you go through a radical. Then you do your second commutator, and that yields another loop. And then you go backwards around the first commutator. Well, now you've gone backwards around your first loop. And then you go backwards around the second commutator. And you've gone backwards around the second loop. And so you've just traced out a commutator. And so that's great. So now you've, got, you've traced out a commutator in this space. When you put it under another radical by the same argument, you must go through a loop here. Um, okay, so right. So now we know that if you have some radical expression, or at least a, a well, we sort of know that we you have if you have some radical expression with like a nesting level of n of the radicals, if you have a loop which is a commutator of commutator of commutators of n times, that's going to turn into a loop uh, of the radical expression, the values of the radical expression. If you are living, oh, so I well okay. Uh, sort of missing a slide here, but so um, so we can do the, exactly the same thing we just did. So as long as we can find um, a path which is a commutator of commutators, which is non-trivial, then um, we'll be done. And in fact, we can. We can actually just pick any of the like we had those three ones, and you can pick any combination that works. So I picked uh, I just picked like alpha beta beta gamma. But actually, like anything non-trivial will, will work. It's like really easy to find a solution. And then you just like kind of do this computation and like you determine, oh, okay, well, I guess this is not trivial. So like this is now how these paths act on the solutions to the quartic. And so first of all, you this is computing um, the commutator alpha beta. And you can see that it does this. And you can just go through and say, okay, well, uh, no, neither alpha nor beta like moves the red root. So fine, it goes through green, go Blue goes to green. Green goes to purple. Uh, green goes to purple. Purple goes to blue. And then you the same thing with beta gamma. So it does kind of an analogous thing. And then you say, okay, well, let me find the commutator of those commutators. And you know, with no particular understanding why, which I point out I did not promise at the beginning of this talk. No particular understanding why you say, uh, okay, well it's not trivial. In particular, like yeah, you're done as soon as you say, well, green, uh, red goes to green. It's not the, um, it's not the trivial permutation, and so there must be no quartic formula that doesn't involve radicals inside radicals inside radicals. And to um, kind of just state again what the reasoning is for that. What this is here is what this path does on the real roots of that quartic equation, x to the fourth minus x plus a. If you move a along this path, the roots are going to get permuted in this way. But if you move a along this path in any radical expression that only involves radicals inside radicals, it's going to fix all the roots, uh, sorry, all the values. And so for that reason, it can't be, it can't be the real quartic formula. OK, so with that warm up, let's uh, Move on to the quintic case. Uh, so here, there's, uh, we want to again show this. Well, we want to exa again examine x to the fifth minus x plus a equals zero. But now it's the case that there's no finite nesting of radicals at all. It's going to work. And this is like a much, you know, stronger fact, of course, than the previous ones that are proved. But it's actually proved in the exact same way. And there's. I mean, essentially, no new ideas in this. So, we get the same um, way permutations possible of the solutions of the quintic. So again, I didn't I didn't bother to put the website here because it's it's the same thing. So if you have x to the fifth minus x plus a equals zero, you start a at zero, you get a blue root at zero, and then four roots around, and then by having small circles in any of these directions, you can swap that blue root. Um, with any of these other four roots, which sort of works. And I guess now, like, actually, there is one new idea, which is I actually want to show that all permutations of these five roots are possible. This is actually true in the previous cases as well, but it, it wasn't necessary to show it. 
But now I actually want to show that you can get any permutation of the five roots just by swapping the blue element um, with the other four ones. And so this is actually, it's, well, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not too hard though. So you can start with um, any po any permutation you want. So here I just picked a random permutation, and you kind of just draw it down with like lines and arrows, and then you can always draw the lines so that it's never the case that three lines intersect. You always just have two lines intersecting, and then you can just look at the intersections and say, okay, I'm I'm going to take those to be transpositions. So this random permutation that I wrote down can be written as, okay, you swap the blue and the red and the green and the purple, doesn't matter which one you do first. Then after that, you swap the purple and the uh, hot pink, and then you swap the purple and the blue. And you just like go through the crossings and say, okay, well, there's, I broke down my permutation and transpositions. And then the next step is that every transposition can be further broken down into transpositions with the blue root. So if the transposition involves the blue root, of course you're done. If it, if it involves, say, uh, you want to transpose red and purple, you can break it down into switch blue with red, switch blue with purple, switch blue with red, and you'll see that you get this. So the blue root stays the same, but the red one moves to purple, and the purple one moves to red. Okay, so it's actually, you can get every permutation of the roots. And like I said, this is, there's nothing about five that's special here. This is true for the other cases too. So this is kind of like what I was saying before. Um, if there's a commutator path that's not trivial on the roots, we know that the solution must have radicals inside radicals. If there's a commutator of commutators, then a solution of radicals has to have radicals inside radicals inside radicals. For the five case, it turns out that there's always a non-trivial commutator of commutator of commutator of commutator for, to any finite level. And that means that there's no quintic formula. Because if you give me a quintic formula, I can just find the maximum nesting of radicals that appears in that formula. You know, say it's 17. I say, okay. Well, then I go into my magic bag, which I'm going to show you in a second, and find a commutator of commutator of commutator blah, 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 up to 18. That's non-trivial. I say, okay, now I have a path. I can move A around this path. The roots of the true quintic are going to be permuted, but the roots of the formula, the values of the formula which you gave me are going to be fixed. And so I know your formula is wrong. And I can do that with any formula that you give me just because I can find the actual finite nesting value of the radicals which appears in there. And uh, okay, so what is this magic bag? Uh, well, it, really is pretty, it really is pretty magical. Um, so if you consider the set uh, S of permutations on the five roots that can be written with an even number of transpositions. So that means this is the same concept which I just uh, described a minute ago. So you know you you have your permutation. Sorry for. And if there's any way at all, it turns out any way. Just write it down however you want, so that you only cross things um, two lines at a time then you count the number of crossings and it's either odd or even and that's an invariant of the permutation. It has nothing to do with the way that you wrote it down. It'll always be the same. So in this case, I think this is odd. So here's one, two, three. So this is an odd permutation. So if you take the set of permutations that are um, even, then it just turns out you can like have a computer check this and in fact the YouTube video that I, um, I think I put this as part of the meetup description, he just does it. He opens Mathematica and says, okay, well here's like 60 permutations, there's 60 of these ones here, and I just like take the commutators of all pairs of those, and it turns out I get the exact same set of 60 permutations back. Uh, why is that true? Well, I don't know, but it's true. It's just like you can do with a computer, and then you're done, because say you want a commutator of commutator of commutators. Well, you pick any non-trivial element of the set S, you write it as a commutator of elements of S, and then you recurse like three times. You know, you go three deep. And then so you can then find a non-trivial commutator of commutator of commutators. And that's how you can compute that there is no quintic formula. Uh, okay, and so this is the, um, this is actually it. This is the, the proof that Arnold, uh, B.I. Arnold came up with. And I mentioned at the beginning that like, I was really surprised by this because I always thought, well, this proof requires this. 
No, the, the one after that. Gal <coughs> Didn't quite get why this was showing that Quintix don't have a general solution, but you can't apply the same logic to say Cortex. Like, what's the what's the transition? What's the difference? So, in the Quintic case, so this the existence of this. So, so in every case, you can find the even transpositions, but it's only in the Quintic case that every permutation, every even permutation, is a commutator of other even permutations. And that's what lets you like recurse as much as you want. Um, well, there are close form solutions to this equation, right? So when you say in the next slide about, oh, not sine, cosine, but there are, you can use special functions and stuff to get close form. So yeah. how does that apply? So that's so right called Galois theory, um, which is like much, you know, even more difficult. It requires like at least a semester of study of an undergrad. Or, um, and the, one of the papers I provided has an interesting comparison. It's, it's possible that Galois theory provides more of a why. Like as I mentioned, like this this proof like tells you how you can do the computation, and you can just say, oh, I see. Like I can actually find this commutator of commutator of commutators if I want to, because it's all finite. It's all permutations. I can just like do it and see. Galois theory might provide more of a why. I'm actually not sure that it does. Um, it does have some interesting uh, other differences. One is that uh, all we actually proved is that there's no general quintic formula. We didn't actually prove that there's any individual polynomial which can't be solved in radicals. Galois theory does that. Uh, and, and in that way, Galois theory is stronger than the proof we just gave. But in another way, this proof we gave is, act, is stronger than what Galois theory shows because it actually is the case that um, Everything we said goes through, even if we allow our quadratic, cubic, quartic, quintic formulas to include more stuff as long as they're single valued. Like all that we required of the uh, expressions was that every function was single valued besides the radicals. So we can include other stuff like sine, cosine, exp uh, exponentiation, um, and it won't matter. We can still show that even when we throw this stuff in, you can't have a quintic formula uh, so long as your only access to multi-valuedness is through radicals. And the other difference that I mentioned is it's, uh, it's just it's longer to go through. I've, I've never taken a course in Galois theory, so I don't, I don't really know anything about it. Um, theory proves that individual, so you mean it points out particular quintics that have no solution. Yeah, that's right. So what this shows is like, so you give me a formula which you say is the quintic, and you I could. I mean, what you put is there's no general solution. Yeah, that's right. But Galois theory says, here's a quintic, here's a quintic equation, and you can't solve this particular one. Yeah. So, like, yeah, this says that, like, any general formula can't work for every polynomial. Right. But it might be the case that every polynomial has some different crazy radical right. expression that you just can't summarize in one formula. Galois theory says that that's not true either. And this has no way of accessing that, that fact. Oh, sorry. So, is it unprovable for things above quintic as well? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, quintic and after that? Yeah, it only gets worse. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, just to, to summarize, so the, so the, the commutator approach shows that there's no general solution to the mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Galois theory allows you to say for a particular equation. Yeah, I think it's actually the case that like x to the fifth minus x plus 1 is a particular case which can't be solved. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But there's something like that where you say, here's a concrete polynomial you can't solve in radicals. Which this proof doesn't doesn't give you. You can't add these like single value things, but you can add like some multi valued functions. I think if you add this thing called like the bring radical, which I think is just like given a, it's the solutions to x to the fifth minus x plus a or something like that. And if you add those in, you can solve. I think maybe all polynomial. Equations, but yeah, you have to add another multi-valued function to be able to do it. Okay, because I thought it was like uh, elliptical functions. That's pro. Uh, that's probably right. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, when you specify equations like x cubed minus x plus a, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no square term. I mean, how come? Why, why are you just saying x cubed minus a, x minus x, and not x, there's no x squared term? Or why do you need those numbers? Because just because it worked for that case, I mean, if there was, 
you know, a, a quintic um, formula for the general case. There must be one for that case as well. Like I left them out just because it makes it simpler and also the proof still goes through. <coughs> like if that case is unsolvable, like the general case must also be unsolvable. So. Is, so are, is there a solution in, com in complex numbers? Um, there are solutions. Like, so if you have, like, any polynomial of nth degree, there are n complex solutions. The question is, like, in this case, is there a general formula that can express those solutions with radicals? But they're, they're there in some <laughs> platonic sense. <laughs> yeah. But you said that, that um, Galois theory says that you, you can't solve any individual thing. Well, so solve here also means write it as a, um, a radical expression. Um, yeah, every time I use the word solve, I meant like solve with a radical expression, not like existence. But the radical expression on the reals. No, on the complex numbers. Yeah. But it's definitely there. It's still, it has solutions in the complex numbers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of this proof relied on like creating these loops, mm -hmm. and we showed that these loops existed by like doing numerical calculations for the JavaScript app. Mm -hmm. um, is that how this proof was sort of originally? Like, how do you show that these loops really exist? Um, yes, there's a couple ways. Uh, one is, um, like the some a gentleman over there mentioned, like you can have, you can turn like that loop, you can turn it into a differential equation, and like solve a differential equation. Um, whether you can solve it in closed form or not, I'm not sure. Probably you can't. So you're back to numerics again. Uh, what they did in like an article that I put in the description is uh, that's it. Thanks. find some space here. They did uh, a different thing where they actually did prove it. And they used slightly different uh, loops than I did. The loops that I used were sort of simple, and it kind of worked for just to demonstrate it. But they used a different uh, a loop. And the loop they used was one where, first of all, it stays on the real line almost all the time to make it easier to analyze. And then there's some special point where it goes up there and does like a really small circle around that, and then comes back around the real line. And so then the way they can analyze it is that they can say, okay, well, say we're considering like x cubed minus x plus a. So as long as it's on the real line, uh, so I guess, uh, it's just like, as long as it's on the real line, moving along here is just like kind of moving this graph up and down. Uh, so as we move it here, or maybe it's moving down, you can, you can just say, okay, well, these two roots are coming together. And then you do like a really small loop around here. And then so in that case, you have to use complex numbers. And you say, okay, well, this is actually behaving like a, a, um, a quadratic. So I'd move 360 degrees around here. The roots are moving 180 degrees. And so they're going to kind of swap places and then move back. So you can do like kind of a detailed analysis like that by choosing a very special path. The other approach, which is um, the easiest, I think, is that you can throw away this idea of just using A and actually allow parameters in all um, the, uh, you know, you have like x cubed minus x cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. So you just allow the entire, all the parameters to be mo uh, modified. Um, so it's harder to draw, but it's definitely it's the same concept. And then what you can do is observe, okay, so you start out with, you know, so say it's So this is the one with the cubic we started. So we started with a cubic like this. If you're changing all the coefficients, you can just change each of these things slightly. Like, you, know, you can make small changes in these and see what the multiplication comes out to be in the coefficients. And so as you change these slightly, you can do any permutation you want, and you can see what's happening in the coefficient space. And I think that's the most direct way to see that it is possible. Uh, but there's, there's a few different ways that I found in the
anything else. Yeah. Does that have any implications in physics or real world applications? Um, I wouldn't have thought no, but um, when I looked at the Wikipedia article for something, maybe it was Cubics or Cortex, they were listing a few like applications at least of Cubics and Cortex, like to like optics or Apparently they come up sometimes, and so I can imagine like, well, maybe if the quintic came up in physics, this would have some implication. But I've definitely never heard of physicists complaining about this. But maybe it, it, definitely not anything bigger than I've heard of. All right, should we move on to the dance party uh, <laughs> segment of the? <laughs> um, sorry, I guess we're done. So thanks again. <laughs> Yeah, I think so.